Welcome to our Boren Scholarship Webinar. On this presentation, we'll do a quick overview on what the Boren Scholarship is, and then we will have a panel discussion with previous Boren Scholarship recipients. This presentation is part of GLOW, which is our Study Abroad Global Learning Opportunities Week. And it is sponsored by the UCLA International Education Office, or IEO. The recording of this presentation will be available on the IEO website on the GLOW page. And if you're watching during YouTube premiere, you're welcome to submit your questions on the chat. So today we have with us three Boren scholars who were awarded the scholarship in 2022. And they are all recent UCLA graduates. Christine and Elise studied abroad in Kazakhstan and Alexis went to Morocco. And I want to thank them for joining us today to share their experiences. I will be the moderator. My name is Will Lear. I am the Associate Director for Scholarship and Alumni Engagement at IEO. And I'm also the UCLA Campus Representative for the Boren Scholarship. So what is the Boren Scholarship? This is a US government scholarship funded by NSEP, the National Security Education Program. This scholarship provides up to $25,000 for undergraduate students to study abroad, but Boren gives preference for students who go abroad um, between 25 and 52 weeks. And that is when you can get the maximum 25,000. So if you go abroad for over six months, you can get up to $25,000. If you go abroad for 12 to 24 weeks, then the scholarship is $12,500. And this is not just going abroad, that's the duration of your program abroad. And if you are part of a STEM major, then you can go abroad on a program during the summer. And if you have a summer program from eight to 12 weeks, you can receive a scholarship of $8,000. But remember, this is STEM majors only. The Boren Scholarship focuses on intensive language study. So language study must be the core element of your program while abroad. And even though the big chunk of your time will be in the classroom, you can also tell Boren that you are going to be really immersed in the language and in the culture by doing maybe some research, volunteering, you can be in the university housing, you can stay with a host family. So the, the goal is to show Boren how you're going to be really immersed in that language and on that culture. And it, does, um, it cannot be any language. It has to be a language that is preferred by the US government and also you must be to a, go to a preferred country. So the language must be a preferred language for the US national security. Now, here is a map with the preferred countries. The green countries and the ones in blue, they are all preferred, but the green are unrestricted. So if you apply to a program in any of these countries, if you have a really good application, you will not have any problems. Now, if you pick a country that is in blue, you can still apply to one of these countries, but you need to have a backup. So you have to select one of those countries in green. And the country you select, the backup has to be uh, on the same language. So let's suppose you want to learn Russian and you apply to go to Russia but Russia is blue. So you will have to pick up another country and most likely Kazakhstan, where you can also have um, Russian language, language learning, but it's a backup country that is green. And the yellow or cream ones, they are non-preferred. And this is a list of preferred languages. 
And you may be wondering what those athlete, safely, toughly uh, mean. Uh, Boren calls these the FLEAS languages, and they are regional flagship language initiatives. These are pre-arranged intensive language study, and you do domestic and overseas language program. So this is a pre-arranged program. You must participate the entire summer and fall. Uh, during the summer, you will be doing intensive language learning in the U.S. There is going to be universities in the U.S. that are approved for this type of program. And then during the fall term, you will go abroad. Now, what is the application requirement? You must submit two essays, two recommendation letters, a summary of your study plan, and transcripts. There was, was also a requirement for a budget, but starting with the 2024 application cycle, the budget is no longer a requirement to BORIN applicants. Now, what is the selection criteria for BORIN? So the two essays that you write, one of them are going, is going to be focusing on US national security. You need to show the relevance of that country, language, and region to US national security. And the other part, you have to pick an issue that um, is a challenge facing global society. So for example, diplomacy, economic development, environmental sustainability, food security, public health, cybersecurity. These are just a few issues, but the list can be much longer than this. You have to argue why US policymakers should be concerned with the national security implications of the issues you discussed. The second essay will be heavily focused on public service. One, the Boren wants to know if you're really committed to fulfilling your, your one year work for the federal government after you come back from your study abroad program. So that is a requirement. You must complete a one year service. But Boren has the preference to applicants who are who have a long-term commitment to working in public service. And also um, you must show on the essays your commitment to language and culture. So how committed are you to learning that language before, during, and after the Boren application? Now, uh, as I said, this is just a brief overview if you're interested in applying for the Boren Scholarship, there are some resources for you. The Boren Scholarship website or the Boren Awards website has webinars, PowerPoint presentations, brochure, flyers. They have an, a wealth amount of information that you should definitely take a look at. But if you go to the IO website, we also have uh, last year's webinar. Um, Michael Saffel, he is a Boren representative, and he came to UCLA last year, and he did a pretty good presentation on the Boren um, scholarship, and he also presented on the fellowship. But if you go to the IEO website, you go under finances, scholarships, or you go straight to ieo.ucla.edu slash scholarships, just go to the tab that says National Scholarships and click on Boren. And that will open a page with resources. And also, I am the UCLA campus, re campus representative, as I said, and you're welcome to email me directly if you have questions. And now it's the fun part of our presentation when we are going to be hearing from our panelists. And I want to thank um, Alexis, Christine, and Elise for joining us today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will start our questions. So we all know that the application for the Born Scholarship requires commitment and a good amount of research. 
Elise, do you mind start sharing with us how long is the process, the application process? And what did you find was the most difficult part? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that the application process itself is quite long. Um, the part that takes the most time, in my opinion, would be writing the essays. So I think I started writing the first draft of my of the essays in September, and um, the application was due at the beginning of February for my year. Um, right now, online, it says that the application for the for 2024 is January 31st. Um, so I would say that the application process probably takes about four months and that I wrote um, a new draft of my essays maybe three every three to four weeks in order to make everything the best it could possibly be. So it is an intensive process, mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you do it gradually, it definitely makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I think this is one of those applications that you definitely can't leave for last minute. <laughs> Anyone else would like to add anything? I mean, just harping on what Elise said, Oops, I turned off my video. Okay, um, just harping on what Elise said, uh, probably the most difficult part. I mean, the application process is really long because there's a lot of just materials that you have to submit and you have to be on time with everything. But yeah, the essays are definitely difficult because you have to make your case for national security, why your language and your country are important. And, you know, if you don't have like a strong background in that country prior to applying, it becomes even more difficult because you have to do a lot of research and stuff. So definitely don't put it to the last minute. Um, and I recommend using your resources and like getting people to, you know, help you read and, and edit your essays. Um, yeah, that makes the process a lot easier and less gigantic. Yes, totally agree. Um, my next question, um, Elise and Christine, you both were attending the Russian flagship program at UCLA. So you somehow you had your program kind of in mind what you were going to expect. But Alexis, you started your program from scratch. So how do you recommend choosing an independent study abroad program? And what are some key things to look into a language school? Yeah, so I definitely recommend giving yourself ample time because this is not something you want to skip over. This is going to be the next six to 12 months of your life. So make sure you put a lot of time and effort into it. I narrowed it down to like four key points that I narrowed down when I was looking at my own schools. One, I would figure out the region you want to be in. Do you want to be in a small city? Do you want to be in the countryside? Do you want to be in the mountains, by water, depending on what country you're going to? And with that, think about what challenges could be associated with those regions. I had friends who wanted to uh, study in the mountainside or in the countryside, and they realized that as a female in a Muslim country in Morocco, being in the countryside could bring different cultural challenges and sexual harassment, et cetera, versus being in a bigger city. Um, second, I would compare different schools and see what each offers. I had narrowed it down to two different schools online. And while the, both were the same price for the year's tuition, the one I ended up going with included uh, cultural immersion clubs. They had cooking classes. They had excursions to different parts of the country, different parts of the country. And it was a lot more immersive versus just tuition. So definitely compare different schools to see what is offered and get the most uh, for your money. Three, look at different housing options. Do you want to be with a host family? Is the school have dormitories? Are you finding your own apartment? Because that is its own process as well. My school had housing included, so I just showed up. But I know some people do have to find apartments, and that's something I would recommend looking at very early. And lastly, do as much homework as possible to verify what you find online is correct. Uh, after COVID, the school I went with did change a few of the policies, and some of the things were different. So when I showed up on day one, some of the things I expected to be there were not there. The school's actual building was different. Some of their programs were different. So don't be afraid to reach out to the school, call, send emails, verify the information, and maybe ask if you can speak to a current student and just pick their brain. Um, I know I had a Boren actually reach out to me from Morocco. They were at a different school and they got to ask questions. Um, so I highly recommend getting in contact with current students as well. Excellent. And I think it's also very important to especially if it's a country that is unfamiliar, 
for you to really do research, right, on the culture and how to act and behave and how to talk to people, how to do hand gestures, because some gestures <laughs> may totally not be accepted in some countries. Thanks, uh, Alexis. Okay, so the next question is, if you receive the Born Award, what steps occur between award confirmation and overseas departure? And what require documents you will need to submit. So Christine, do you mind start this? Sure. So between getting your award, confirming that you're going to accept it and actually going abroad, there's a number of things. There's more than a number. There's tons of things that you have to do um, you know, between these two periods of time. And so one of the things, you'll probably have lots of questions. And so something that they have, I believe, like in June, like towards the end of the school year is a born convocation. So it's basically a two day seminar. Um, ours was online, but I think for the future generations, it will be in person after COVID. And it's basically a two day seminar that gives you like a lot of information that maybe you didn't have before they like clarify like your service requirements and like you know what's required of you like when you finish uh your born study abroad and it just gives you a chance to like ask the program administrators questions or if you have like any concerns so don't miss out on that that's very important um and then beyond that there's a lot of pre-program forms that you have to fill out and as is the theme with the board, you must start early because each of these uh, documents have their own timeline and some are due earlier than others. And then others, while other documents are due later, they're no less important and you should still start early. So some of the things that I'm thinking about is like passport. If you don't have your passport, you should be getting that like, you know, very early in the year. Um, clearance form and proof of matriculation. So make sure you're communicating with your home university um, about these important documents because you can run in, into trouble uh, as me and a, a few other students who were going abroad did. Um, proof of sound health. So your medical clearance and your health insurance form. Some um, healthcare providers will not, depending on the program you're doing and like the forms that they give you, the healthcare providers may or may not um, give you the information or fill out your forms. And so it's so important to do these important things early because it can potentially hinder your departure date or when you get your stipend from born and nobody wants that. Um, you'll also need to do language testing and so pre-program language testing. And I think for people who did flagship, um, we did a testing like much earlier in the year, so we didn't have to test again specifically for Boren, but you will have to do that. Um, and then progress reports, you'll have to write those, but that's kind of like when you actually go. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Anything else comes to mind, Elise? I would just say that, um, like the they will give you access to like a born portal if you receive the award and it will have like all the documents that you need to submit but i would say that in addition to that it's helpful if you print things out or um, you like make copies of the paperwork and you put it all in one folder so that you can see like okay this is the date i did it i have like proof that i did it and make sure that everything's in one place um, just for your own peace of mind excellent so for future applicants, they need to take it, to keep in mind that once they are done with the application, they are not really done. <laughs> if they get selected, there is a whole bunch more requirements that they need to, to fulfill. Thank you. Okay, now this is a point that I get quite a few students asking me. One of the requirements from Boren is that you must be enrolled at your home university during the entire duration of your program abroad. And some students come to me and say, well, I'm, I'm a senior and how, how can I, you know, is there any option for me? Because once you graduate from UCLA, you cannot participate on Boren scholarship. Then you have to apply for Boren fellowship. So I know all three of you graduated in 2023. 
So Alexis, do you mind sharing a little bit of your experience? How can you postpone your graduation at UCLA in order to remain eligible for the Boren? And how would you go about doing it? So first of all, I would definitely not do what I did. I tried figuring it all out on my own and I ended up running into a lot of issues. So I would directly go to Ms. Corey Hollis. She's out of the College Academic Counseling um, or the CAC. Just send her an email or try and get in touch with the office right away and explain your situation. Personally, I was supposed to graduate in December of 2022. But again, uh, UCLA refused to write the letter of matriculation. They required me to be an actual student taking current classes. So I would definitely ask if they would write the letter on your behalf, just saying you're a matriculated student. Some universities will do that. In my year, they did not. So what I ended up taking in order to graduate in spring of 2023 was I took online UCLA extension courses. They're the same UCLA courses, but they're done on a Zoom or online format. They're the same, they get credit. Um, you are with UCLA professors and with other UCLA students, but it is a way to still be a UCLA student while also focusing on your language requirements. You could take just one class. You can make it an elective class, something hopefully a little easier that doesn't take up too much of your time because the language is your primary focus, but it is a way kind of around that requirement if you wanna make sure you're still a scholar and not a fellow. Okay. Did you, uh, Elise and Christine, did you have different um, experiences? Yeah, we had a slightly different experience. I mean, Christine can add to it, um, but because the Russian flagship program kind of already exists and there are specific classes that you're taking and like credit is um, distributed through Bryn Mawr, um, a different American university, um, we just had to take a leave of absence that we had to file. It was also through Corey Hollis, um, but then we just transferred those classes credits back when we returned and that the, that counted as us being um, enrolled at UCLA technically. Okay, so for you two it was a little bit easier just because you're already in the flagship program. Excellent. Okay, so the Boring Scholarship is not just about financial support for you to study abroad. They have benefits after you come back as well. So Elise, do you mind sharing with us what opportunities and programs are available to Boring scholars after they complete their language study? Yeah, absolutely. So once you come back from the language study, um, it's, it's once again another process um, to sort of find um, like a federal job. And so Boren has specific sites and um, like programs for that, uh, that they will allow you to access once you return. Um, you're not allowed to access anything while you're abroad. Um, so once you come back, they sort of start the process of applying um, for federal work um, and different websites and their own portals. Um, but in addition to the service requirement, there are like other opportunities um, for Boren scholars. Um, for instance, if you're applying to graduate school, um, I know that some um, schools will waive the application fee if you are a Boren scholar or uh, for other scholarships as well. And there are also a variety of different like grants, fellowships, scholarships um, for graduate school. Um, and, you know, having applied for the Boren, successfully gotten it and sort of gotten through that whole process can only be a help to you if you would like to apply for any of those things in the future. Okay. And I'm going to ask the next question already because I think it's kind of connected. Um, is there anything else required after you return from your language study besides completing the service requirement? So does anyone want to add a little more? I can add. Um, not only do you have to do language testing before you go abroad, but you have to do it again after you come back. And so, but this one is a little more intense because you actually have to go to Washington DC to do testing at federal testing sites. So you will do a speaking and a reading test at the Foreign Service Institute, and then you will take reading and listening at the Defense Language Institute. And taking these exams is the only way to get your final born disbursement. So don't think that you can just skip out on it because oh, I did the year abroad, like I'm fine, like I don't need more testing. If you want to get a job with Boren's help, these uh, language tests are going to help you and like be on your track record. So like if you want to work at the Department of State or Department of Defense, like these are the scores that you'll use. And it's also just uh, for Boren and um, the government as a whole to like do some testing. So don't forget about that. 
Okay. And just going back to the previous question a little bit, um, I think one thing we didn't touch on was born scholars have some special treatment when applying for government jobs. Can anyone share a little more about that? Um, we'll see, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I do know that being part of like this uh, NSCP NSEP, uh, community means that sometimes you have like priority registration for jobs or they do hold like certain a certain number of spots for born um, students. For example, I'm looking at a few summer internships with various government agencies and it literally states, are you a born scholar or born fellow? And they will pull you into a different like group of people so that when they're looking at your application, in some ways it is like you get priority uh, registration, you get priority access and they will treat you slightly different. Um, so it definitely benefits your resume and your applications going forward. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is that you are treated as an insider, kind of an, app, an inside applicant instead of part of the big public applying for jobs. So that is a great benefit. And I think you also have a great network opportunity, right? With other students that receive the Born Scholarship. So in terms of applying for a job and starting your career, this is really a, a great opportunity. Can I uh, chime in, uh, we'll see. Um, I will say that, I mean, if you talk to anyone who's applied to work for the federal government, it takes a really long time to go through security clearances and get checked and like actually get your job. But I have heard from numerous born scholars and have recently experienced myself that like as a born scholar you apply to these jobs that are in the NSEP job portal and the pool of applicants is smaller and you like things happen much more quickly like the application process goes through much more quickly if you get uh, a job offer or a tentative job offer it comes through much more quickly so you'll get it like within months instead of like going through like a year or two worth of trying to go through this process just because like you are already vetted by the Boren um, and they kind of know like the skills that these kinds of students are coming in with. Excellent. Yeah, so I would also, sorry, just like to add no, one last ahead. thing about applying for jobs is that the Born will also host like a job fair. Um, this year it was in September and they will once again like reiterate like the foreign service, um, the ser federal service requirement, excuse me, and um, give you sort of insider information on how exactly you should be filling out your resume and what opportunities are available right then. And they will also like invite different agencies and organizations um, to come speak with you so that you can meet them, pass out your resume things like that. Um, so that is also very helpful in a part once you get back. Excellent. So students should really be looking into not just the financial support that they get going abroad, but if the applicants are interested in working in public service, there is a lot of benefits when you're applying, actually applying for your job or for a job in public service. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I would like just to ask one question regarding the financial disbursement. So if you receive the um, Boren Awards, when should you expect to receive the first payment from Boren and how will they send those funds? That they send it to you, to the university, to your study abroad program? How does that work? And anyone can start. Okay, so I obviously did that independent program. So Boren sent me disbursements through Zelle, which went directly into my bank account. And then it, then it was up to me the, to then pay the school and pay for housing and ex whatever was needed. Um, however, I think the most crucial thing to remember is Boren does disperse the money a little bit later or may not be exactly on the date you're expecting. So please prepare accordingly. I know there's a lot of people in these Boren chats expected money for example like on the first of the month and two weeks later they still hadn't gotten funds and they were really stressed out getting groceries or paying their rent so plan accordingly i would definitely have some sort of nest egg available if you need to pull money from this account until the disbursement comes in i also had to pay out of pocket for my flight to get to morocco and then i was uh, reimbursed by boren so just plan accordingly budget effectively um, be mindful that the disbursements and the money will come it just may not be the most timely and effective manner Okay. Was it any different experience for the flagship program? 
I think um, the disbursements also kind of depend on when you submit all your documents. And so if you submit them later than your disbursement that delays your disbursement but even still the people who like we submit like I even I had experience like I tried I submitted everything like on time and for some reason like me and the other flagship students I think who were going from UCLA going to Kazakhstan like we didn't get our disbursements until like the day that we were leaving like we were in Washington and then we were going to leave and I didn't we were not communicated to that we needed to like have paid or like sent the money to our programs for that first kind of like uh, payment or something. So there was a lot of confusion and frustration and stress. Um, so d what I would just say is like, do everything that you can on your part and like try to stay in contact with like your program administrator and the board uh, and just be in constant like conversation about like disbursements and like paying things off. Okay. Yes, those are very helpful <laughs> advice because I think when you're expecting, especially on the boring, it's a big chunk of money and you're expecting that fund to come and it gets delayed. I'm pretty sure it makes your study abroad experience a little more stressful than what, you know, studying abroad is already a little bit stressful. So many new things happening, but you don't need one extra talking about your budget to add to the stress. And I'm really enjoying this conversation, but I think we came to our last question. And that I would like to hear from each one of you. What was your best takeaway from the boring experience? And how will you apply the lessons learned to future career opportunities? Anyone want to start? Okay, I could start. Um, I think a lot of things come to mind and not to be really cheesy, but I think you're really a lot stronger than you think because I had some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows while being abroad. And I think it really taught me to just be so adaptable and flexible and just roll with the punches, which is so, so important for future careers, especially in the US government where nothing's gonna go according to plan. Um, and I just, I really learned a lot about myself and how I, how I operate in stressful situations and you learn a lot about how to cope in these uh, situations. And lastly, I think you learn a lot about how to deal with people from different backgrounds. I think it's one of the most important skills you can possess for not only work, but just your day-to-day -day life, how to deal and uh, live and work with people who come from all walks of life, different religions, different socioeconomic statuses, different genders, et cetera. Um, it's a really important skill to have and you learn how to respect one another and to see uh, life through a different lens. So I would say go into your experience with just an open mind. And even when you're having a hard day, just know that that will pass um, and this will ultimately help you in the future. Excellent. Next. Um, yes, it, it does sound very cliche and my answer is going to be a lot like Alexis's, um, but I would definitely say that like resilience was my biggest takeaway. My time in Kazakhstan absolutely challenged me um, academically, linguistically, emotionally, physically, for sure. There were a lot of health issues I had that I didn't necessarily anticipate um, that were directly related to being there. And at the same time, it was also one of the best years of my life. Um, and I would say that it taught me so much about myself and it really helped me grow as a person. All the same things that Alexis said, how to work with people from all different backgrounds, um, how to trust in yourself and just gain a lot of confidence in your overall skills and abilities, not just when it comes to speaking the language, but just like who you are as a person and what you have to offer to any career or, you know, school going forward. Okay. Yeah. And I guess like, my answer will be kind of tailored more towards like the end, like you're coming back from studying abroad, but you can also like take this advice while you're studying abroad, but just use your resources. So like when you're abroad in your country, whatever resources you have available to you, um, you know, whether you need like some kind of support or like specifically academic or language like support, you're there in the country for a reason. So like use everything that is available to you. Speak to as many people as you can. If you're living with a host family, like 
become their like best friends and like, you know, not like use them, but, you know, develop a relationship with them and use the resources that you have um, to really get ahead and, and do what you went to that country to do. And when you come back, again, use your resources. There's tons of opportunities available to you as a born scholar. This wasn't just $25,000 to study abroad. This is an opportunity to get federal work experience very quickly and get career insight and mentorship in your desired field. So ask questions. Um, the NSEP, the people at NSEP, like there are there are people specifically who will help you if you like email them with like uh, you want your resume to get checked or your cover letter or you have questions about an interview or just like any kind of career question that you have, they will answer it. So like use them um, and connect with other people that are born scholars or fellows, especially maybe those who study in the same country as you or learn the same language, because that network will only help you like as you progress in your federal career. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for sharing your experiences with us. I am sure this is going to be very helpful to future applicants. And now as we go back to our presentation, we come to our last slide. And I just wanted to leave with you all, you all that are watching our contact information at IEO. If you have any questions on study abroad, or if you are interested in learning more about Boren, you can either email me directly. I gave my email address on the previous slide, but if you forget that, you can also email info at ieo.ucla.edu and they will be um, sharing that email with me. So I hope this was helpful to you and thanks for watching.